Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to see you today. My name is Steve. I am an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be here today with you guys. You know, uh, it's kind of funny that, you know, we're talking about, I'm talking about pride today. So the meeting will probably get cut short because I've really had no relationship with pride my whole life. So, you know, we, <laughs> and I still tend to lie a lot. So let that be a uh, opening statement for you. Welcome to our Al-Anon people and the other people that have just got here that have never been to an AA meeting before. We appreciate you being here and everybody else that's here today. You know, this is the greatest thing that has happened to me. And, you know, the thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is that it works. And it works because of the 12 steps and the God of my understanding. And I'm so grateful for that today, that the things have been stripped away in my life that blocked me from that power. And certainly one of those things is my pride. And boy, that's something that I've always struggled with. So great topic today. I I will qualify first. Um, You know, I, I am one of those alcoholics that, you know, and I think this that's what it is when uh, people like us drink, when we put something in our system, when we put booze in our system, it kicks off that allergy, that phenomenon of craving to where I don't have an off button. And when I put alcohol in my system, something happens to me. And the part that is really hard for me to understand is that I never know when it's going to end. And I never know what's going to happen to me when I put booze in my system. And it was like that over and over and over. And I always thought that if I could just change these things out here, if I could just change my circumstances, if I could just change you guys, then I would be able to drink successfully. I would be able to handle my alcohol. And it just never happened that way. But something that was worse for me than drinking and, you know, what would happen when I would drink The thing that was worse for me was when I wasn't drinking. And that's when I really had troubles because I needed that sense of ease and comfort. I needed that thing that would let me breathe again. I needed that thing that would let my shoulders down and let me, you know, be a part again. But whenever, you know, a lot of good loving people, people that really cared about me, You know, they would say things to me like, you know, Steve, if you would just quit drinking, your life would get better. If you just quit drinking, these things wouldn't happen to you. If you just quit drinking, you might have your kids back in your life. But see, they didn't know what it was like for me and for a lot of us when we just quit drinking. Because, you know, in the in the doctor's opinion, it talks about how we become restless, irritable and discontented. And for me, that's an understatement, right? Because I become rageful and I just can't stand life on life's terms. And, you know, I'm irritable all the time until I can get that next drink. And what happened for me over and over and over was that I would drink and things would happen and I would come out of that and I would make those promises and I would hurt the people that love me one more time. And I would take that stuff and put it in the garbage can, right? I would take those things, all that guilt, shame, and remorse, and I would put it down within me. And that was the thing. That was why I could not stand to be sober, because all those things were were always trying to come to the surface. And it would drive me back to the drink again and again and again. Because, see, when I quit drinking without a program of action, I'm crazy. And that's you know, really what happened in my story of my, my alcoholism is that because of that, because of not, you ever notice that a lot of us, we tried to quit drinking, right? And a lot of us would just, and for me, I would just try to not drink, you know, today, I'm just going to not drink. And boy, 
it seems like we're doing time. You know what I mean? That every second, every 10 minutes seems like days. And it's just one minute after another. But I'm not drinking today, right? I'm just not drinking. And it used to just drive me crazy because I have this other part, the greater aspect of our disease, which is the obsession of the mind. That thing that talks to us all the time, right? Now, I can only speak for myself and maybe Lemmy, but uh, the only thing, (laughs) see, I have this thing above my shoulders. And what happens with it is that I'm an author of a fictional story. I write this fictional story, a story that's not real, and then I believe it. So, you know, when you make up a story yourself and then you believe it, man, that is truly a form of insanity, right? And because of my need to be right, that I could never say that I was wrong, right? I could never say that that story wasn't correct. And that's truly where pride came into my life because it was always blocking me. Because, see, I don't want to look bad. And when when I don't want to look bad, I'll do anything it takes to protect that false self. I'll do anything to protect my false identity i'll do anything to protect how i look and what you guys think of me right that becomes the most important thing in my life is what you guys think of me because that's where i get my self-esteem is from you guys and it's all pride based it's all pride based and yet i don't see that and for me the thing about it was is you know it took for me to lose everything in my life, almost my life also. Hmm. The thing about this program and the thing about the things that we look at when we do our inventories and we actually take a look at these things and look at the character defects that are tied to all those things in my inventory, you know, pride really was top of the list for me because it's so important of how I look. I can be laying face down in the gutter and still looking down on everybody, you know, and we hear that all the time and it's so true. So, you know, I had been to treatment a couple of times. This is when I moved from South Dakota to California and, and, I had been out of treatment for like six weeks and I, you know, and I'm vigorously working step none, right? And I decided to go to the bar at 6.30 in the morning for some social drinking, right? And, you know, that thing happened to me. That thing happened to me one more time, right? Where that phenomenon of craving would hit. And of course, I've been sober for six weeks, so I should be able to handle my liquor, right? I should be able to handle my booze. But when I put booze in my system, something happens right and i have no control over it i have no way of knowing where i'm going to end up and so um i was driving back on maybe some of you have heard of disneyland but i was driving right by the freeway right by disneyland at nine o'clock at night and i drove under a semi a semi truck with a fully loaded trailer at 90 miles an hour and and you know that, that the state of California, they really frown on you parking your truck underneath the semi on the freeway. They just don't like that. You know what I mean? And anyway, my whole truck was crushed. It was, you know, I'm on the floorboard and just, you know, and I remember saying, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll never drink again. If you just get me out of this one, I'll never drink again. I promise. And it took them quite a few hours to get me out of my truck and all that. And, you know, I kept my promise to this day. And that was in 1981. But my sobriety date is January 10th, 2006. 
So, but I never did take that drink again, but my pride still stood in the way, right? And I, I can't tell you the depths that I went to not drinking. And in the end, I was left homeless. I was sleeping on a bale of hay in a broken down horse stall in between two chicken ranches. And if you've ever been around chicken ranches, they really stink, right? It's bad. And in this broken down horse stall, there were thousands of rats. And at night when the sun would go down, the rats would crawl on me and the fleas and the flies. And I had ate for a long time and hadn't showered for months and all that. And that's where my life leads me when pride is running my show. And, you know, and when you look around, when I looked around and, and it was like, where's my kids? Where's my family? Where's this life that I built? It's all gone, right? Because I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. And what happens to me? So I was at work one time, backing up just a little bit, and two sheriffs walked into the motorcycle shop that I was working in, and they arrest me for allegedly sexually molesting my son. And I got to tell you, that is something that will give you an instant resentment, right? That is something where, you know, how could she do that to me? How could she do that to me? And again, pride is blind in my eyes, right? And the only thing that I can think of is me. And I can't think about what my son is going through, right? And anyway, I had to go to court, of course. and. I couldn't see my son for six months and the case got dismissed. It wasn't the truth and all that. My sponsor always wants me to throw that part in there that the case got dismissed. But anyway, so when, even when after the case got dismissed for me to go to Chuck E. Cheese, which is a pizza place for kids. I don't know if you guys had it over there. Probably not. But for even for me to take Blake to Chuck E. Cheese, I had to have a court appointed person with me, with my son. Resentment, 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 right? And I can't see what's really going on because I'm blinded by pride. I'm blinded by the need to be right. I'm blinded by, you know, I got to make others wrong. Because I got to protect me and my identity and all those things, right? That's when I went into the dark side there that I talked about ending up homeless and all that. And so I did what any 50-year-old man would do at the time. I called my mommy, right? And uh, she bought me a bus ticket to go back to South Dakota. And that's where... I got back with you guys, right? And that's where I started this adventure, this journey, if you will, of recovery. So we started on the steps and I got a sponsor. My sponsor is named Scott. And uh, we started on the steps and we started doing the deal, right? And you know, the funny thing about my sponsor, Scott, before I asked him to be my sponsor, I really liked everything that he was saying in meetings and all that. It really sounded like he, you know, knew the book and all that. And I really liked all that stuff that he would share in meetings up until the time that I asked him to be my sponsor. And then I no longer liked what he had to say. You know what I mean? Because he asked me to do things. He asked me to look at things that I didn't want to look at. Right. Pride stands in the way, always stands in the way. It's the thing that blocks me from God. It's the thing that blocks me from you guys. It's the thing that blocks me from myself because I am tied to that story, right? I am tied to those things. 
So I get into the four step, I get into the inventory process, right? And I have resentments. I'm resentful of Mandy for having me arrested, right? That was my cause, right? What part of self does it affect? All of them, right? My pride, my self-esteem, my personal relations, my ambitions, uh, my sexual relations, and certainly my pocketbook, right? All of those. And then when I got to the fourth column where it says, what were my mistakes? Because, you know, and I hate to be too judgmental and critical right here, but the book really does say that putting out of the minds of others the wrongs they have done, what were our mistakes? And for me, I can't say what was my part. Because for me, what it is is I'm saying that she had a part, right? And what I do is I deflect then and I put part of the blame on her, right? And what happened for me, you know, in the inventory process, it talks about we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle, right? And so that is so important that I look at these things from an entirely different angle, right? And that's that thing too with our relationship with God. If I always have God in a box, that's where God is, is in a box. And what I tend to do is tell God who God can love. And actually, I start being God of God, right? And that doesn't work. So anyway, I get into that fourth column. Where was I selfish? Where was I dishonest? Where was I self-seeking? And where was I afraid, right? And when I look at those things, it was like somebody hit me with a two by four. Because I actually got front, confronted with the monster, okay, me, that when I'm not drinking, when I don't have something in my system to buffer that pain, to take care of that stuff that's in the garbage can, I become violent. And I'm a violent, violent person. And I didn't see all that because I'm blinded by my pride, right? And what I actually got to see was, you know, it was me, it was me that had Mandy, my son's mom, up against the wall with the knife up against her throat. Because that's what happens to me when I don't have something in my system, right? When I don't have that sense of ease and comfort. I had her up against the wall and I, and this morning at the other talk that I did, I talked about regrets, right? And that was certainly a regret that I have to this day. I have that regret of seeing that fright in her eyes and the way that she looked. And is, is he really going to do it this time? Is he really going to do it? Is he going to kill me this time? Because, see, I'm so full of fear that I become rageful. Because when I'm afraid, I lash out in anger and rage, right? And, again, pride blocks all of that stuff, right? And I got to see that it was me. And let me tell you, I do not condone violence on any of God's kids, and especially women. And I just want to make that clear that nobody should have to put up with that stuff. And I'm not trying to justify it in any way, because I got to tell you, I was completely nuts. And my garbage can was completely filled with me, right? And pride blocks me all the way. And I got to see that it was me that had Mandy on the ground all kinds of times. And, you know, and it's like, wow. And so what happens is when I let my pride down just a little ways, I start to get cracked open. I start to see that, man, the truth in my life. You see, I can be honest when I look good being honest. But if I don't look good being honest, that's a whole different story. My pride stands in the way of that. And I don't, you know, I hold back because what are you guys going to think of me if I tell the truth, if I become vulnerable? And that's the thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is that we have to have the courage to become vulnerable, to look at these things that we don't want to look at, to lean into it, to work six and seven and actually lean into the fear, lean into the pride, lean into all those things that block me from God. And yet my pride says, no, no. 
pull away from that. You don't want to look at that stuff, right? So obviously pride was certainly on my list and I had so many other people that I had harmed, right? So many other people that had harmed, I had harmed, I, I put my hands on. So when I was growing up here in the Black Hills, my mom married my stepdad, Phil, and him and his brothers were very, very religious. And uh, this is no kidding. We went to church eight times a week, every day and twice on Sunday. And, um, you know, and I kind of liked it. You know, I had this, you know, growing up, had this relationship with God, right? And we had this restaurant here in town. And we had a really cute hostess, okay? And I come to work one day because I work there at the restaurant and I see my stepdad's car sitting down in front of the motel room. And I go down there and I open the door and my stepdad is in bed with the hostess having sex. And I remember at that time, if that's what this God thing is about, I don't want nothing to do with it. I don't want anything to do with this. And, you know, it says on page 52 where it talks about, I looked at the defects of others and made a wholesale condemnation for everything else, right? That I couldn't see the forest for the trees. I never gave the spiritual side of life a fair hearing. That's me, right? Because he had hurt my mom, right? And my mom and my stepdad got divorced and I lived by that for a long, long time where I did not want a God in my life anymore, right? Because if that's what this God thing is about, I don't want nothing to do with it. And again, that's pride, right? That's me being right and living by that story, the story that I made up. And it has nothing to do with God. It has to do with man, right? Funny story that when I came back here, and I think I was two years sober and I started going back to church, right? I, I tried to have an open mind and go back to church. Well, I'm going to church and one day the elders of the church, they come and they go, Steve, we've gotten together and we're kind of thinking that maybe you don't fit here and that, you know, maybe you ought to find some other place to go. So I'm two years sober and getting kicked out of church. Now there's a deal, right? There's something to be proud of. And uh, because, you know, what they said is, you know, it's, it's not the Bible as Steve sees it, okay? And uh, so true. Anyway, the only reason why I'm telling this story is because I have my sponsor in the background during all this time saying, make your amends to your stepdad. Make your amends to your stepdad. And I'm going, what did I do? What did I do, right? But in that fourth column, it talks about self-seeking, right? And the definitions under that, do I withdraw? Do I uh, bully? Do I withhold? Do I gossip, right? That's self-seeking. And with Phil, I did every one of those things. And finally, at one time, the pain got so bad. And I heard my sponsor say so many times, you know, Make your amends to your stepdad. And I got to tell you, I think I really did it just to get him to shut up. You know what I mean? Because he just, he's relentless. He's like a pit bull. You know what I mean? Just won't let go. Anyway, I, I, I call Phil and he's driving in Montana. And I say, look, I wasn't the best stepson I could have been. I want you to know I was wrong. And he had to pull over on the side of the road because he was crying so hard, right? And I was crying. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was so grateful to be able to make that amends with him. Because last year during the COVID, he, he died of COVID. And that was, you know, God doing for me what I could not do for myself and, and cleaning that stuff up. But see, all those years, pride stood in the way and blocked me from doing that. You see, God has always given me these opportunities to grow spiritually and to do these things. 
and to lean in on these things, but I pull away because of my pride and it blocks me. So obviously, you know, when I did my eight step, Mandy was very first one on my eight step list, right? Because man, I treated her so badly, so badly. And she's living in California. I'm here in South Dakota. And, you know, my sponsor did a good job of, you know, helping me with that because we knew it was going to be difficult. And, you know, in the 12 and 12, it talks about how you, you, you might do some and then you'll look at the other ones and then maybe you'll get to some harder ones and all that. However, it is in the 12 and 12. My sponsor apparently never read that part. You know what I mean? Because we're going to do Mandy right away, right? And what happened was, is my home group, the early risers, I walked in there one day and on the way in, this gentleman stops and says, Steve, the early risers got together and we bought you a plane ticket to California to go see your kids. And I got to tell you, that was the first instance where I saw you guys' kindness and, and, and all that and your giving and all that. And see, pride can stand in the way of that also. Anyway, I flew to California. I met Mandy and my son Blake in the parking lot of the grocery store. And I said to her, you know, I know that I've harmed you. I was wrong. I was so wrong to do that. What can I do to make it right? And she said, F you, right? And she used, she wanted me to do things to my body that are physically impossible. Okay. And that conversation was really a tough one. And Blake is standing there and he's crying. And, and Mandy says, he'll be fine when you get the hell out of here. And that was actually my first amends that I did. Right. And I remember leaving that parking lot. And I went and called Scott, my sponsor. And I said, you know, if this is the way the amends process is supposed to go, please sign me up for some more of this because this has been great, you know. And he said, did you make the amends? And I said, yes, I, I tried. I never got to that part where, you know, what can I do to make it right? Or do you have anything to add? Because she had already added all that, right? And I came back to South Dakota and you know it was so tough because my kids my sponsor said Steve I want you to call every week at a certain time call out there and for two years they didn't pick up the phone and when they did it was yeah okay bye you know that sort of thing and when I'd say I love you they would say okay yeah bye right and my sponsor just said, get in, dive in, work with others, start sponsoring other guys, do the deal, let God do what God does. And, you know, I always stand in the way of that stuff. And two years later, I get a call and it's my daughter, Crystal. And she says, Dad, I want you to know that Mandy says we can come to South Dakota to see you and see all that time and that's the way this God works you know what I mean and all that time what's happening really is God is preparing me to be a dad and I got to tell you I made a lot of other amends but when Crystal said they could come to South Dakota, I had already started my financial amends. And I was $103,000 in debt. I don't know if that's 103,000 pounds in you guys' currency, something like that. But it was a lot, right? And I had, and I'd already started making my amends and I don't have any money, right? And I had started working for Black Hills Harley-Davidson at the time. 
and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do about my kids wanting to come and all that. And all of a sudden, one day I'm working on a bike and I get a call, says, Steve, come up to the office, please. And, it, you know, us guys, us Alkies, when we get a call like that, it's like, okay, what did I do? They finally found out, right? They finally figured out that, uh, you know, who I am and all that. So I went up to the general manager's office and one of the owners is there and he says, Steve, we know about your financial things. We know what's going on with your family. We know that you're in recovery now. Because see, I was the guy that would go to work and leave for lunch and not come back for two weeks. And, you know, it's, it's kind of weird to ask you really funny questions like, where were you? You know, and I have no answer for that. Right. But anyway, I'm up in the general manager's office and they said that and that what they said was, we're going to fly your kids here. And we're going to give you money for food. And, you know, that company did that for me for five years. And it took me 10 years and two weeks, two weeks after my 10th AA birthday, I paid off all of that money. And, you know, and it's so funny. If, it, if you have financial amends to make, it seems like the minute that you start making your amends, you start to have more money in your pocket. It's a spiritual thing. Can we explain it? It's not one, you know, one and one is two. It doesn't work like that in God's world. We start to make those amends and God takes care of us, right? Because you see, on page 63, it always talks about making decisions based on self, right? That later placed me in a position to be hurt, right? And I always made decisions based on self because of my pride, my ego, the thing that blocks me from God and you guys. And I always make those decisions based on self. So can I travel from here to where the truth lies in my heart? Can I do that? And I got to tell you, regaining that relationship with my children, with Blake and Crystal, you know, was just incredible. Just incredible. And today, Mandy and I, have a relationship that is just incredible. I mean, we're not together, but anytime it comes to the kids and all that, you know, we're, we're together. And that is such a beautiful thing. And I didn't do that. I didn't do that. God did, right? And again, the thing that stands in the way of all that stuff is me and my character defects, my need to be right. My need to be important. My identity. So. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But how many people. Have somebody. That pushes them up against their spiritual wall. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. A few of you. And what I mean by that is there is there people that, you know, it's just hard, right? And I had one of those people in my life. And and see, I became the shop foreman of Black Hills Harley after all that stuff, right? They put me in that position because when we show up, we do pretty good, right? When we show up for work and we do the deal and we're there to be of service, we do pretty good. And I had one of those guys in my life and we'll call him Chris because that's his name. And, uh, and Chris constantly pushed me up against my spiritual wall. Right. And because of you guys, you know, isn't it funny that when people push us up against our spiritual wall, we learn the principles of this program. We learn patience. We learn tolerance. We learn forgiveness, hopefully, right? But Chris was always pushing me up against my spiritual wall. And you know why? Because Chris was just like me. He was arrogant, full of ego, always needed to be right. And my sponsor says, Steve, I want you to pray for Chris. I said, you know, I don't want to pray for Chris. I want to punch him in the nose. 
or as Lemmy says, give him a throat punch. You know what I mean? And so the thing about that is, is if I'm not praying for people, I'm probably praying on them. And there's a big difference, right? Because I used to pray on people all the time and I'd put my hands on them. And I, you know, I was that person, right? I was that person that caused all that discontent in the people around me. So I have a suggestion and obviously you don't have to do it, but next time that you're praying, thank God for those people in your life that put you up against your spiritual wall because they help us. They help us grow. They help us to be guided back towards God, right? And, you know, as I was a shop foreman, I also dispatched the work. I ordered all the tools. I dealt with the motor company. I dealt with the insurance companies. I did all this stuff, right? I was just, and my boss one day <clears throat> decided he was going to give my dispatcher job away to Chad. And man, it hurt my pride. It hurt my identity. It hurt all those things, right? I felt like I was being stripped of me. And then two or three months later, it's like, wow, thank you, God. I don't even want that job anymore, right? And God does for me what I can't do for myself. So 15 years into it, 16 years into this, being at Black Hills Harley, they stripped me of my shop foreman job, right? And guess who they gave it to? Chris right and oh man that was like i can't tell you what it did to me and i'm in recovery i'm doing the thing and i'm doing the deal but i got to tell you it it put me in a funk for a while and my pride was always in the way because how am i looking it's more important that i look good than i'm than if i'm useful or not right and it's so funny so I got the opportunity in December last year to retire. And what a blessing because God has taken care of me. And anyway, so about two months before I know I'm going to retire, this starts up. This thing that I have above my shoulders, right? And I got to tell you about this thing above my shoulders. It's a great problem solver, but it's a terrible master. And, you know, that is the thing that I start to listen to this, right? And I just remember, I'm thinking, you know, I'm just going to go around and I, you know, because I love the guys in the shop and everything. It was just, you know, we, we lived, we were a family for all those years. And I just love these guys. And I was going to go around to Troy and Chris uh, Kanigi and, and Big Dog and, you know, all these guys. And I was going to say, you know, hug them and say, you know, goodbye and all that. And I was going to leave Chris till the very last one, right? And what my mind was thinking was, you know, when I get to Chris and I'm getting ready to walk out the door, I'm just going to lean into him. And really give him the what fors, you know what I mean? And really let him know what I think of him, right? So I went around to all the guys and I'm crying and doing all that. And I start to lean into Chris and Chris leans into me and he says, Steve, I didn't always say it, but thank you for everything that you taught me here. And see, I could have ruined all that. I could have ruined all of that because of my pride, because of my need to be right and to make others wrong. And it's so weird that my character defects, I don't know about you guys, but my character defects seem to really be tied to my tongue. And when my defects are tied to my tongue, it can really, you know, cause some damage. Because what's on the inside shows up on the outside. And if I'm full of pride and running my show, 
that's what I get, right? Because what I'm putting in, garbage in, garbage out, right? And that's the thing about pride, that it blocks me from the very thing that I need the most in this program is a God of my understanding. And so I have to let God out of the box. I can't tell God who God can love. Good thing for that, right? (laughs) Because most of you would be gone, right? (laughs) But it's so cool that when we look at these things, when we look at how pride blocks us, that we get a different understanding of it, right? And I can see how making decisions based on me, based on self, based on, you know, the way that I perceive things and the way that I perceive things is not always correct. When I look at it through my eyes of self, I get off track, right? And that's why it's so good to do inventories. That's why it's so good. You know, the inventory in our 11th step, where it says we when we retire at night is in the 11th step, right? And it talks, there's a one short little question in there that always trips me up because it asks when we do that 11 step inventory, when we retire at night, it asks, was I kind and loving towards all? And that's a heck of a question, right? Because my pride tells me, well, yeah. I was kind and loving towards all, but that isn't true a lot of times. See, it's real easy for me to love the lovable ones and the unlovable ones. That's kind of tough. So I push them away. Right. And so I got to be able to see you. And the only way that I can see you is if the pride is stripped away, my need to be right is stripped away. My arrogance is stripped away. And the way that I look at things has to be different and that's why a sponsor is so important that I can look at things in a different at it from a different angle and I can come at life from a different place right and that's wow it's so cool you know this relationship with God having a sponsor working the steps helping others sponsoring other people Doing what we're doing here today is not a punishment. And yet my ego and my pride tells me somehow that it is. And you know why that is? Is because my ego knows that it's going to be found out. That somehow it's going to be exposed to, for what it is. And let's, our ego is not our enemies. All of us have ego. It's the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning. The thing about it is, is when it gets out of whack, something is goofy there, right? And 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 I act in such ways to protect me and to protect myself and to do all that stuff. And that is really tied to my pride. You ever notice that when you get up in the morning, your elbow doesn't say, hey, whoa, whoa, me, my elbow. It never does that unless it's hurt, right? Unless it's got some something wrong with it. But not so with the ego, at least mine anyway. First thing you get up in the morning, it's like, okay, we have some things to talk about, right? And it needs to have some attention drawn to it. It needs some sort of drama or unhappiness or chaos. And if it doesn't have that, it'll create that. And it will use my pride to bring those things about. Because it's really tied to my arrogance and my need to be right and to make you guys wrong. And man. That's how pride blocks me in so much of my life. And I'd like to say, uh, you know, that I've worked my way through pride, but that would be a lie. As with all our character defects, you know, they don't seem to go very far. For me, anyway, they don't go too far. They seem to be still there. And if I don't stay spiritually fit, they start to raise their ugly heads. And the thing about when I get spiritually sick, it looks like you guys are the ones that are spiritually sick. And I start to pull away from you and I start to back off and I start to let that pride stand in the way because I'm better than you. And man, that is dangerous for me because what will happen is I'll be out there drinking one more time. 
because I keep putting those things in the garbage can and I keep looking at that stuff that's wrong with the world and it's wrong with you. And I don't look at what's wrong with me. And I don't want to look at that stuff because, you know, why do I want to look at me when you guys are the ones that need to change? And I'll let you in on a little secret. If you're waiting for other people to change, you're probably going to be waiting for a while. And the thing about, I just want to say that, you know, when I started praying for Chris before all those things happened, Chris never changed. Chris never changed a bit. But what happened was, is the way that I looked at Chris changed. And that's the thing with us is that we get to look at it from a different angle, right? We get to look at things from a different perspective. Time we got here. So, tell a little story. And I hope this happens for all of you guys. I hope that through the amends process, through working the steps, through having a God of your understanding, through helping others, that something will happen in your life that you'll see, oh, that's why that happened. That's why we do this. Okay? And the thing about regrets, I want to share with you today that I believe we all still have regrets. I know that I do. I can only speak for myself. But today, I try not to let my regrets turn into self-pity, right? And I use my regrets for, for propellant to push me further into this program, to push me more into my relationship with God, because I don't ever want to do those things again. I don't ever want to have one of God's kids up against the wall ever again in my life. I do not ever want to put my hands on one of God's kids ever again. And so that regret, I have that in my psyche, right? Because if you have regrets and you feel like you're a victim and all that, you won't recover if you stay in the self-pity, right? But use it. Use it in a positive manner. So the other one more regret that I have is that my brother Stan, who really, really struggled his whole life, he was so insecure. He was, you know, he had addictions, terribly bad. And uh, just, you know, he just suffered from the bondage of self so much. And and anyway, I made my amends to him and, and and did all that and and but my regret is is that I took my mom who I'd made my amends with and cleaned up that past and and today I try to spend as much time with her as I can but anyway I took her from South Dakota up to North Dakota to see her brother my uncle Bobby who had smoked too many cigarettes and he lost his voice box. So they couldn't talk on the phone and, and all that. But I took mom up there and we were at Judah's house and mom was in the shower. And um, I was sitting on the couch with Judith and John and, uh, and I got a phone call from my brother, Mark. And Mark said, Steve, Stan got murdered. He got shot in the back and hit in the head, and he's dead. And I called my sponsor right away and talked to him, and then I had to go. Mom had gotten out of the shower and had, you know, went in the bedroom to get dressed, and I tapped on the door, and I said, Mom, are you dressed? And she said, is there something wrong? And I said, yeah. And she said, it's Stan, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it was Stan. And the reason why I said that earlier about, I hope you see that in some time in your life, all these things that you do in this program lines up and you go, 
That's why we do this thing. And that's what it was when I talked to my mom, that through all this stuff, I got to be there at that very moment when my mom got the news about her son, my brother. And I got to hold my mom's hand all the way back to South Dakota. And I got to be there for her. And the thing about it is, is, and the regret that I have is that I didn't spend more, much more time. I should have spent more time with Stan, even through his addictions and all that, right? But I stand in judgment sometimes and my arrogance and my pride blocks me from that, from doing the very thing that I need to do the most. Because here's the deal. You never know when that person is not going to be there the next day. And I'll ask you today, is there things that are standing in the way of your life? And is your pride standing in the way with somebody in your family or somebody that's close to you that you need to make amends to or you need to draw into? Don't wait. Get to that amends process with your sponsor. Do all the other steps first, obviously. But get to that process and lean into it and don't let your pride and your fear block you from doing that because we miss out, right? We miss out on that very thing that we need, that connection. And that's what this whole program is about, right? Is about relationships, my relationship with God, my relationship with you guys, and my relationship with myself. How is, how is this thing treating you? Is your self-talk bad? Do you talk badly about yourself? Most of us would not let anybody else talk to us the way that we talk to ourselves, right? That has to change. Be loving and kind with yourself. Be loving and kind with the people around you. Because in the end, that's the only thing that we have is love for one another. And that's the only thing that's going to defeat all this hate in the world. And that's why it's so important that people like us are building this spiritual community, right? So that we can bring love and tolerance and we don't let pride stand in the way of that. It's so important. So I have to set down my need to be right, my need to be important, my identity and all those things so that I can be useful to somebody else. But my ego and my pride battles me that whole way. So, you know, my prayer for all of us today is that we can let go of that stuff. We can let go of those things that block us from God and from each other and from ourselves. Because it's important, especially here in this program, that we stand shoulder to shoulder, that we say, come this way. We can do this. I've been through that. And if I haven't been through it, I know somebody that has, right? No matter what we've gone through, there's somebody that's experienced that already. And we guide those people. And, you know, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, I think time is up, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, my love for all of you goes across the great pond, right? And it, uh, you know, we are all so connected because the thing about it is, the thing that connects us all is that we all have God's DNA running through our veins and all of creation has God's DNA running through it. Right. So we have to lay down all this other stuff, right? No matter what color your skin is, no matter what your sexuality is, all those things have to be laid aside so that we can help one another because that's what we're here for is to help each other. And so don't let pride stand in the way of that. Connect with your God of your understanding. Connect with each other and be useful, right? I love you guys. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.